All right, so ladies and gentlemen, so sorry to interrupt. We are going to get started here. I hope you are well on this Monday, the 17th. I see uh, mostly new faces, which is always good for us here at the Institute of World Politics and uh, in between a few old ones as well. Um, I want to thank Eric for coming out today again. This is his second lecture in an area uh, in which he also spoke on roughly, what was it, a month and a half ago or so? Yeah. And so I'd encourage you to also check out his original lecture. I think that was in uh, April, was it? Um, about, about a month and a half or so ago, yeah. And you can find that on our YouTube page, the Institute of World Politics. My name is Kevin Dunn. I am the Public Outreach and Events Coordinator here at IWP, and we are a graduate school of statecraft and national security, focusing on the arts of statecraft and their ethical practice. If anyone's interested in learning a little bit more about the school, feel free to come up and ask both our distinguished speaker, who is a current student right now, or myself. We can certainly point you in the right direction. A little bit more about today's event. It will be, it is sponsored by the Kosciuszko Chair of Polish Studies, and uh, within that also their recent Intermarium Initiative, which is broadening their focus out on Eurasia. And I uh, just want to, of course, introduce the topic today, too. No doubt uh, that will be revealed very shortly, but it's going to be on uh, Russia's domain in the Middle East and the intersections, cultural uh, intersections and overlaps there. Um, so uh, Mr. Kuzmalian is a senior fellow, in addition to being a master's candidate here at the Institute of World Politics for national security, statecraft and national security studies. And he is a senior fellow at the Eurasian Analysis Institute. If there are any questions about what they do, in fact, I believe their current founder and president is here as well, um, over there. So if you have any questions, feel free to come up and ask. And uh, without further ado, as always, it's an absolute pleasure to have you come speak, and I look forward to seeing what you say. Can we give a warm round of introduction for our speaker? Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Good to see you all. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Horakevich for this wonderful uh, opportunity. And of course, I want to thank the Institute of World Politics for helping me to put this event together um, and providing this uh, great venue. So today I'll be talking about Russia's interaction with Islam during Tsarist and Soviet periods, some of the pan-Islamic movements that occurred in Russia and in Russia's peripheries. Uh, sort of I will touch on um, Muslim communism, the emergence of Muslim communism. And of course, uh, uh, I will conclude my presentation by talking about the revival of Islam after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So as you may know already, uh, Russia has had an extensive uh, interaction with Islam. It's been very uneasy, uh, to put it mildly. And uh, the unprecedented Russian expansion has sort of witnessed the incorporation of Muslim communities in North Caucasus, Ural Volga region, region uh, Central Asia, into the Russian Empire and uh, later into Soviet Union. And for decades, for centuries, um, Russian authorities, uh, czars, rulers, the Soviet regime, they tried to sort of come up with a strategy that would help them to successfully integrate um, Islam into Russia's socio-economic or socio-political life. And even though uh, Russia's interaction with Islam goes as far as to uh, 15th century, I decided to begin my presentation with uh, Catherine the Great, simply because she's the first uh, Russian ruler who tried to sort of be more pragmatic and strategic towards Islam. Uh, and she's the first ruler to establish, so create sort of an Islamic establishment uh, to under Russia's imperial rule. And to, to put it this way, domesticating Islam in Russia, which uh, also set the foundation for later ru rulers and including the Soviet regime and even uh, the modern uh, Russian um, uh, presidents. So uh, let's get started. So, uh, as I mentioned, Catherine was the first Russian ruler to realize that uh, uh, it was time for Russia to be more uh, strategic towards Islam. She rightfully uh, recognized that uh, she could utilize the help of Muslim communities throughout uh, the Russian Empire as Russia was expanding towards Central Asia or Turkestan. After coming to power, she immediately uh, forbade the practice of proselytization, which was a very popular pr practice during Peter the Great. Uh, the forced conversion, uh, conversion of Tatars and other uh, Muslim minorities. And she was sort of trying 
to create a, an image of Russia as a modern European state. Uh, and she was trying to convince everyone that Russia had given up some of its anachronistic attitudes towards religious and uh, ethnic minorities. But there was particularly one factor that truly inspired, influenced Catherine, and that was the German school of thought or German system known as Kameralism. So uh, Catherine herself was not ethnic Russian. She was German and barely spoke Russian. So in regards to Kameral uh, religion, Kameralists believe that Religious argument, religious dissatisfaction ultimately damaged the state and uh, hindered the increase of its population, which according to Kameralists was the main uh, uh, factor to create a national wealth. Uh, so, uh, in short, they introduced the concept of toleration, meaning that, okay, uh, do you, have, uh, you have a dominant religion, but it's also okay to have uh, religious minorities and uh, uh, other ethnic minorities. However, they also put a lot of power into the hands of authorities uh, in terms of intervening into religious affairs, particularly if the religious uh, uh, state authorities uh, thought that religion was being damaging to the state or was uh, hindering the economic activities. Uh, in short, uh, they introduced the concept of toleration of other religions. In the meantime, put uh, a lot of uh, power into the hands of the sovereign uh, to agree where they depicted the authorities as sort of a moral guide to help religious minorities to get uh, the best out of uh, religious uh, practices. Well, Catherine obviously embraced this uh, philosophy vigorously. She not only applied this to uh, Islamic and uh, Muslim minorities, but she dramatically uh, cut the influence of the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, she also used Kameralism in her foreign affairs uh, to intervene in neighboring states, particularly in Poland, uh, where she justified her intervention by saying that she was there to, um, uh, you know, help help Christian population. And interestingly, uh, a lot of uh, European intellectuals and thinkers sort of welcomed Catherine's, Catherine's involvement in Europe, particularly French philosopher Voltaire, who even wrote a letter to Catherine saying that Russia should uh, come to Europe and liberate uh, Europe from two uh, great disasters on Earth, first being the plague and second the Turks. And at this time, the Ottoman Empire was uh, growing increasingly uh, worried about uh, Catherine's uh, increased involvement in Europe uh, because this was simply set a precedent for the uh, Christian minorities within the Ottoman Empire. So backed by the French, uh, Russians declared war, um, uh, war on Russia. The first Russo-Turkish War broke out in 1768 and lasted all the way till uh, 1774 and was concluded by the Treaty of uh, Kuchukainarka. According to this treaty, uh, the Russian Navy gained access uh, to Black Sea, um, Russia improved its standing in Crimea, and most importantly, uh, from a Russian perspective, St. Petersburg got the right to become the protector of Christian minorities uh, within the Ottoman Empire. However, the language of this treaty was sort of ambiguous, and the Turks uh, granted themselves the right to intervene in Russian internal affairs to protect uh, the Muslim uh, minorities within the Russian Empire. Well, obviously, this was something that really bothered the Catherine because the Turks saved no effort in doing so. And uh, her uh, uh, sort of her fears were manifested uh, on the wake of the second Russo-Turkish War, where Sultan Selim III claimed Russia's Muslim subjects. And in order to prevent this from happening, uh, Catherine the Great uh, decided to sort of create an Islamic establishment under Russia's imperial rule, to sort of create an Islamic bureaucracy. And uh, uh, a person uh, by, the by the name ba Baron Egelstrom, who had just returned from Crimea, and knew exactly how to deal with the Ottomans, she ca he came over to sort of help uh, C Catherine to pursue her agenda. And with his help, Catherine created the Ecclesiastical Assembly of the Mohammedan Creed in Russian, Duchovne Sabranyek Magametskova Zakona. And again, the whole idea was to create an Islamic uh, establishment, a bureaucracy that would be controlled by the central government. And this very uh, assembly sort of set the foundation for later rulers, including modern-day Russian presidents. 
Uh, well, uh, she also did other uh, other things to win over Russia's Muslim subjects. Uh, she ordered the printing of Quran uh, throughout the Russian Empire. In St. Petersburg alone, I think she printed close to 3,000 copies and distributing among uh, Russia's uh, Muslim communities. This was a very uh, diplomatic uh, step uh, from her side, which sort of uh, sort of gave her a time to uh, to sort of continue her expansion towards Turkestan by utilizing local. Muslim populations. Fast forward to 19th century when Russia Empire witnessed the first major uh, pan-Islamic movement known as uh, Jadadism. Jadadism means new, new method. It was originated among the Tat uh, Crimean Tatar intelligentsia. Most of them were descendants of uh, Tatar mullahs. Uh, and it was sponsored by rich Muslim families and through missionary work reached all the way to Central Asia. So technically, Jadids uh, were appalled by the backwardness of their Muslims within the Russian Empire, particularly in Central Asia. And uh, they uh, claimed that the reason was the departure from Islam. And they cited Islam's glorious past when the Muslim world was the international center for knowledge and education. So uh, it, they, they claim that Muslims within the Russian Empire should go back to pure Islam to claim uh, their uh, glorious past. And the purpose was to introduce the European methods of teaching science, philosophy, art, etc., etc., without altering the true uh, Islamic traditional identity. Moreover, they believed that they could use Islam as a sort of a tool for national liberation for Russia's Muslims and sort of bringing uh, Muslims in Central Asia, North Caucasus, under one sort of country, one state. And the man who led this uh, movement was uh, Ismail Gaspirinsky or Gaspirali. Among some moderate Muslims, he's known to be a, a, a great reformer, but however, it is also fair to acknowledge that he did in fact uh, harbor pan-Islamic uh, sentiments, particularly his Russian Islam, uh, Ruski Islam, was heavily circulated in Central Asia and uh, sort of defined Muslims' relations with infidels. And uh, his pamphlets were kind of used in Central Asia to radicalize local populations. And his book, Tarjuman, uh, which uh, translated means uh, reforms, talked about um, uh, creating a, a sort of a, a new Muslim country uh, and sort of uh, liberating Russia's uh, Muslim subjects. And this was a great threat to Russia, uh, obviously, because at this time, uh, Muslim elites within the Russian Empire were very uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, they favored the Ottoman Empire and the latter two saved no effort to bring Russia's Muslims under uh, their control which takes me to my uh, next point. So 10 later after the movement broke out, something really uh, important, significant happens in Central Asia, in Andijan, or uh, what is today uh, the Fergana Valley in Uzbekistan. The, this was the first uh, massive religiously motivated uprising. Uh, so as Russians uh, moved towards uh, Central Asia and began establishing themselves there, the local Muslim population grew increasingly dissatisfied by the Russian present, presence. So, uh, led by Muhammad Ali, or Duke Chishan, who was the uh, spiritual leader in Central Asia, uh, he, he organized an army of 2,000, and uh, then uh, he was joined by 20th Turkestan Battalion. They attacked the Russian positions in Central Asia and sort of tried to get rid of the Russian rule. 22 Russians were killed. And of course, uh, uh, unquestionably, this was a religiously motivated movement because uh, Muhammad Ali himself wanted to establish a caliphate in uh, Central Asia. However, there were other contributing factors as well, uh, primarily economic. So as Russians moved to Central Asia, uh, local Muslim populations, they lost the peasants, lost their lands. Uh, Muslim merchants went bankrupt because they couldn't compete with Russian merchants who had benefited greatly from the newly introduced fiscal policy. But uh, no question about it, it was primarily uh, uh, an Islamic movement. And uh, it, a later report was produced claiming that mo many of its leaders were uh, sort of radicalized Jadids. And of course, Russians successfully suppressed this movement, uh, executed Muhammad Ali and his follower uh, publicly. 
And uh, they tried to uh, understand what was the reason of this uprising. They did a meticulous research, uh, sort of considered all the factors, and concluded that uh, the leaders were heavily uh, corp uh, sort of cooperating with the Ottoman Turks, and Turks too sort of sponsored and backed this movement. Uh, speaking of cooperating with Turks, uh, 10 years after the Andijan revolt, another significant event takes place uh, in the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Revolution of 1908. So a nationalist faction known as the Young Turks, they toppled Abdul Hamid in, uh, in Ottoman, uh, uh, Ottoman Turkey and Empire and established their rule. And these guys openly talked about pan-Turkism, pan-Islamism, and wanted to uh, unite all the Turkic people from Ottoman Empire's western point all the way to uh, Central Asia. And obviously, one of the first steps that they sort of uh, uh, imposed to uh, achieve their uh, greater agenda was getting rid of uh, non-Muslim minorities. So you had the Armenian genocide, where close to uh, 1.5 million were killed and uh, deported. You had the ethnic cleansings of Greeks and Assyrians. And the Young Turks also heavily supported uh, Russia's progressive Muslims within the Russian Empire, who were heavily engaged in pro-Turkish uh, uh, propaganda through printing house, confessional schools, etc., etc. So uh, at this time, the, the Department of uh, Police in Russia sort of uh, was compelled to uh, increase its uh, surveillance operations, increase the number of informants, and they again uh, produced another major report uh, accusing the Young Turks of igniting pan-Islamic sentiments within the Russian Empire. So, uh, as this whole thing was happening, uh, a man uh, in Russia by the name Pyotr Stalipin, who was appointed as Russia's uh, prime minister in 1906, uh, he, gets in he becomes in charge of the Muslim question. He was a reactionary monarchist, uh, served under uh, Nik Tsar Nicholas II, and he did everything to solidify the positions of the Russian Tsar. So, uh, he, came to, he became the prime minister and uh, realized that Russia's Muslim question is not merely a religious question. It's a state security question that needed an immediate uh, attention. So he believed that in order to reduce the influence of uh, confessional schools in Russian Empire, a uh, campaign for general literacy had to be conducted. And uh, initially, the teaching of uh, native languages would be allowed, but eventually Russian would become the dominant language. He believed that uh, the Russia's Muslims would never appreciate the Russian way of life without speaking the language or understanding uh, Russia's history. And other bureaucrats too in Russia grew increasingly by the impact that uh, Russia's confessional schools were uh, having at the time. So instead of uh, Russian language, you had Turkish being taught. Instead of Russian history, you had uh, uh, the history of uh, the Ottoman Empire being uh, taught. And this sort of created a dichotomy uh, between Russia's Muslims and ethnic Russians. And uh, he and other bureaucrats eventually made a decision to uh, take control of the confessional schools. So by 1911, uh, the Russians were heavily engaged in raids in uh, Ural Volga area in Tatarstan alone. They uh, shut down close to 70 institutions, Islamic institutions, including printing houses, schools, uh, community organizations, and so on. So in 1909, Pyotr Stalipin gets assassinated uh, by a re liberal revolutionary. He was attending an opera with Nick, Tsar Nicholas II. He managed to let the Tsar know to remain inside the building. The assassin exposed himself, pulled, pulled the trigger, uh, sh uh, shot him twice. Uh, three days later, uh, he, he was declared dead. And uh, about five, six years ago after his death, Tsar Nicholas did something really unwise. Uh, so, as part of World War I, uh, World War, um, One mobilization, he signed a decree according to which uh, uh, the Muslims of Central Asia or Turkestan, including uh, Tajiks, Kazakhs, and Kyrgyz, were to be deployed to the Eastern Front. Well, uh, many Muslims took this as a personal insult because the decree was signed on the eve of Ramadan. So the immediate was, uh, result was the mobilization of the Muslims in Turkestan. You had thousands, people, thousands of people uh, killed, uh, hundreds fled to eastern Turkestan, what is today northwestern China or Xinjiang province, and the uh, area is still pretty volatile. There are massive disagreements between Xinjiang and the Beijing. 
So this uh, uh, uprising is known as uh, Urkun uprising, which again shed light how volatile and unstable the relationship were between uh, Russian uh, authorities, uh, Russian czars, and uh, their Muslim subjects. Well, we all know what happened to Nicholas II and his family. After communists came over, he was executed with, uh, along with his family. So uh, again, massive event in, uh, in Russia, the Bolshevik Revolution. And uh, well, Muslims had pretty mixed feelings about the uh, uh, Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, elites, primarily Muslim uh, elites, were against Bolsheviks because they thought that this whole movement would alter uh, traditional Islam. Uh, Jadids too, moderate Jadids were categorically against the Bolsheviks uh, and eventually joined whites in their fight against the Reds or the Bolsheviks. Some quit politics or simply fled to the Ottoman Empire. But uh, as you may know already, uh, Bolsheviks were known for their masterful propaganda. So they began their propaganda to sort of win over their Muslim uh, uh, populations. They began depicting the uh, Tsarist Russia as an ultranationalist entity that uh, showed no mercy to anyone, which was true to a degree. And uh, a lot of Muslims bought this. Uh, and uh, they even successfully, Bolsheviks, uh, began recruiting Muslim communists who thought that Bolshevik revolution would sort of alleviate the socioeconomic challenges that communities were facing throughout the Russian Empire. Uh, another important, like sort of a pro propaganda step that uh, Bolsheviks took was uh, was the statement they released during the Supreme uh, Soviet of Petrograd, uh, where again they showed uh, sympathy in their statement to Russia's Muslim subjects and some of the challenges they had to endure. And many Muslims in Central Asia took as a message of creating their autonomous uh, region, uh, Islamic uh, uh, region in Central Asia or Turkestan. However, uh, this initiative was also short-lived because Bolsheviks took control of Central Asia and imposed their communism uh, rule uh, there as well. So the development of Muslim communism was quite interesting. Technically, it was the combination of uh, ultra-left Jadidism and uh, Bolshevism. Uh, and uh, although many Muslim communists sort of agreed with the uh, economic policies of Bolsheviks, a full reconciliation was technically impossible given the anti-religious stance of uh, Bolsheviks. Uh, particularly, Muslim communism uh, refused to give up jadid religious and ethnic concepts. Instead, they tried to focus on some of the features that uh, Islam and communism allegedly shared such as embracing group rights, welfare for poor, etc., etc. And uh, things seemed to be working for Muslim uh, communism, and, but out of nowhere, suddenly you had this uh, division growing up within Muslims. So Tatarstan and its capital of Kazan uh, were uh, sort of poised to become both the Islamic and communist center for Russia's Muslims. And obviously, uh, this was something that uh, other non-Tatar uh, Muslims uh, could condone. So then you had this uh, massive uh, uh, d division among Muslim communities, which Soviets obviously exploited masterfully. Another thing that I really want to talk about today is the uh, Baku Turkological Congress and the alphabet reform, which was a major milestone for uh, Bolsheviks. So uh, as obvious as Bolsheviks came to power, uh, they began addressing uh, the Muslim questions and they grasped the, the, uh, the power with the threats of pan-Islamism in mind. So at this time, Russia's Muslims did not have their own alphabet and uh, read the uh, uh, Quran either in Persian or in Arabic, which sort of kept the Islam Islamic past, the Islamic past alive and enabled uh, Muslim spiritual and cultural connection with uh, Muslim centers such as Istanbul or, or Kabul. So uh, Russians or the Soviets uh, began pushing for the alphabet reform. Uh, sort of they, they, they organized this Congress claiming that it was time for Russia's Muslims to give up the Arabic uh, uh, script and instead uh, use the Latin alphabet. Among the fiercest uh, supporters of Latinizations were Azeris uh, and perhaps uh, this is why the whole uh, event took place in uh, Baku. And you can see this gentleman enjoying fine wine and delicious food, communism in the making. Uh, so, uh, they, and Russians eventually uh, did achieve their agenda. A decision was made in 1926 to introduce the uh, Latin alphabet. Uh, needless to mention that Tatars uh, sort of uh, were against the Latinization. Instead, uh, they advocated for a slightly moderated version of uh, Arabic. 
and hence the growing uh, division between Tatars uh, and Azeris, and of course, uh, Russians took advantage of this. Well, this was, like I said, a major milestone for the Bolshevik, uh, uh, for Bolshevik authorities, because it eventually not only undermined the pan-Islamic sentiments and the Muslim unity, but also it eventually opened the door for a Russification program, and eventually Cyrillic uh, was introduced and Russian became the dominant language uh, among uh, Russia's Muslim, Muslims. Uh, in 1930s, obviously, the Soviet Union uh, witnessed the widespread purges of, uh, of Stalin, and Muslims obviously were no exception. It is calculated that during his reign, close to 30 clerics disappeared without a trace. Uh, since 1917, you had close 1,300 mosques being shut down in Tatarstan. So there was a harsh crackdown on Islam, on Christianity, on any type of uh, Christian establishment that existed uh, uh, in the uh, Soviet Union. However, uh, the, the KGB and the Stalinist government uh, were heavily control, uh, were, uh, were engaged and were controlling Muslim population from the spiritual board of Muslims, which many claim was the descendant of the same assembly that Catherine the Great is established, this, uh, the Mohammedan creed. Uh, so obviously, KGB was heavily inv uh, was involved. They uh, monitored the Muslim communities, knew exactly what was happening within the community. Uh, and, uh, by the way, the Spiritual Board of Muslims is still around, and uh, I'll come back to this. Uh, so, in the 1950s, there were no major change. Uh, again, the, uh, the, the decade witnessed a massive crackdown on any type of religious sentiments, uh, be it uh, Islamic or Christian. However, things were relatively different during the 1960s. Uh, this is when the Soviet authorities uh, realized that, okay, we've done enough to undermine any religious sentiments through the empire. Uh, no, maybe we can give some freedom to our Muslim uh, subjects as well. So you had limited number of mosques being built in Soviet Union, uh, a limited number of uh, Quran being uh, published. Uh, however, uh, the, the Soviet authorities learned the lesson in a hard way, and uh, my favorite example to elaborate on is the Soviet inv invasion of Afghanistan. And uh, this is when they realized that uh, for uh, Soviet Union's uh, Muslims, obviously Islam came first, uh, then loyal to the Soviet regime. So technically what happened as Russia invaded Afghanistan, many in Central Asia interpreted this as an assault to Islam and you had a massive uh, public outcry. And in the beginning uh, stage of the war, uh, the Soviet regime deployed troops from Central Asia. Once they got there, they began mingling with their uh, Muslim fellows in Afghanistan, talked about Quran, talked about Islam and simply refused to fight. Moreover, a good portion of them actually joined the Mujahideen and began fighting against the Russians. So this was a heavy lesson for the Soviets, and they eventually pulled back their Central Asian troops and deployed ethnic Russians who did fight. So, uh, uh, I want to talk about the uh, situation after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, well, uh, as Soviet Union collapsed, obviously Islam uh, experienced a massive revival. Uh, in 1990, you had only 106 mosques in Russia. By 1996, the number had grown to 7,000. And uh, exactly this time, you have the influx of uh, radicalized missionaries coming from Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Iran. And they obviously came armed uh, with uh, their radical Salafist ideology and became, began indoctrinating Muslims, a good portion of them, in the Ural Volga region, in North Caucasus, and obviously in Central Asia. And this is when the Russian government sort of began drawing a line between good Islam or, and bad Islam, or as they called, official Islam versus foreign Islam. Well, unfortunately, this had a counterproductive result for Russians uh, because many Muslims, again, interpreted this as an authoritative intervention in Muslim affairs, and some of them protested by sort of uh, endorsing these uh, jihadist movements. Other uh, contributing factors that sort of caused the radicalization of the population in Central Asia, where, our, of course, Khomeini's revolution in Iran. Many Uzbeks were, uh, uh, were sort of concerned that this would set a, a precedent in Uzbekistan and the country would become something akin to Khomeini's Iran. 
Uh, as I mentioned, Soviet intervention in Afghanistan was uh, interpreted as an assault on Islam. Uh, Mujahideen were particularly engaged in cross-border uh, smugglings. You had li literature, uh, radical literature being uh, exported to Central Asia where local youth was being indoctrinating. And uh, the Russians sort of did contribute to this too for the first, uh, sake of the argument. So in early 90s, uh, as I mentioned, all religions were experiencing a massive revival. Uh, Orthodox Church was again active, and you had former Albarachiks who once rejected Christianity. Now they were heavily uh, engaged with the church, and the church itself was uh, becoming very active in Russia's uh, internal uh, affairs. So Christianity was being celebrated through Russia. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you had uh, the Muslim community was still being antagonized throughout the uh, through, throughout Russia, and many Muslims were, still had to get permits to visit the tombs of their Islamic saints. Well, obviously, some protested, some took the radical path, and again, like I mentioned, began advocating uh, these jihadist movements that were occurring in Russia's uh, Muslim areas, such as Tatarstan, uh, Central Asia, or uh, Dagestan in North Caucasus. Well, the situ situation was no different in Ural-Volga uh, region, in Tatarstan, Bashka Tatarstan, or in North Caucasus. Uh, you had the rise of Islamic insurgency in Tatarstan, and uh, well, after so many decades of oppressing religion, be it Christianity uh, or Islam, and communism proved to be inefficient, there was sort of a spiritual vacuum among many in Tatarstan, and uh, people were ready to absorb anything that came, uh, came that their way. Well, obviously, Saudi Arabia took advantage of this, and they began exporting their Wahhabism to Tatarstan, and uh, they were pretty blunt about it. And this was done through their ch charitable org organization known as Taiba. You had the local uh, Tatar youth being indoctrinated in mosques, in madrasas, uh, local uh, local mosques, uh, uh, in classrooms, and obviously many Tatar students became engaged in terrorism. You had uh, pipelines being blown up that, that ran through Tatarstan. You had massive terrorist uh, acts in Moscow. So the situation was uh, really uh, abhorrent, and this posed an existential threat to Russia. And if Tatarstan fell, this would set a precedent for other republics within Russia. Um, well, in Dagestan, two Wahhabi missionaries from Saudi Arabia openly indoctrinated students in classrooms. You had the fundamentalist newspaper al Kaf uh, that was uh, heavily circulated among, uh, among the people. It was just amazing how available these radical materials were. were. And uh, you would be surprised to learn that in some bookstores in Moscow, too, you had some crazy fundamentalist uh, literature being uh, freely sold. Um, so the, the case is particularly interesting with Chechnya. The, this is a classic case of a, a secular nationalist movement becoming an Islamic fundamentalism. So what happened? So after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Soviet Union, Chechnya was among other republics that wanted to pursue its independence. And, and a man by the name Zohar Dudaev, who was, a, who was Chechen, a Soviet uh, air general stationed in uh, Estonia, he sort of came back to uh, Chechnya to lead this uh, independence movement. And he made it clear that he had no any intention to sort of replace uh, Chechnya's secular institutions with religious institutions. And he even famously claimed that if religion took over Chechnya, it would be it would some it would be something akin to Spanish Inquisition. Well, unfortunately, things didn't really work this way, and uh, part of the reason again has to do with Russia's uh, asymmetric response uh, to Chechnya, and they didn't pay much attention in the beginning years because of internal p power uh, struggle in Moscow. So Russians, uh, the, the asymmetric response of Russians in Chechnya did really open the door for militant jihadists from abroad. Uh, in 1995, in, yes, I believe in 1995, at one point there were 4,000 detonations recorded uh, in Grozny in just one hour. And again, uh, you had moderate Muslims uh, fighting for independence or whatever, but they obviously be began turning a blind eye to the presence of militant jihadists because they had one agenda, getting uh, rid of uh, uh, Russia's, um, uh, Russia's rule. And... Uh, which uh, sort of uh, takes me to my next point. And uh, again, like I mentioned, you had massive uh, missionaries, uh, militant jihadists coming from uh, abroad. 
they came well equipped. They came with money with uh, funded by Islamic uh, organizations. Uh, they came with a motivation to fight. And, uh, and when they came, they found their fellow Muslims in Chechnya suffering from alcoholism. They were poor. So this sort of was another driving factor of imposing a harsher version of Islam on their fellow Muslims. But eventually some of these leaders became role model for Chechen youth because like I said, they, were, they came with weapons, with cash, and they were enjoying a great popularity. So among, uh, among the famous fighters who came from abroad uh, was Umar ibn al-Khattab, uh, who came from Saudi Arabia, and uh, he was pretty successful in the beginning years uh, of the war. And he even pushed the Russians back. Uh, again, was uh, enjoying a great popularity. He e even um, uh, was able to win over the notorious warlord Shamil Basayev, who was engaged in massive uh, terrorist atro uh, t atrocities, including the uh, Beslan uh, school crisis, where about more than 300 people were killed, most of them kids. You had the, uh, Mos uh, the Moscow theater siege, again, uh, more than 100 uh, people were killed. Uh, so, uh, and this is when it was becoming obvious that Chechnya was about to stumble into becoming a fundamentalist uh, country. And uh, Basayev himself, so Khatab is on the left, Basayev is on the right, he actually aspired to create a caliphate stretching from uh, Black Sea to uh, Volga area. And uh, in 1996, something uh, significant happens. Uh, Zohar Dudayev, the secular leader, the nationalist leader of Chechen in independence, uh, gets assassinated by Russian air reconnaissance. He was on the phone with one of the members of the Russian Duma. The air reconnaissance cut the signal and they dropped the rocket on him. So uh, the next leaders, including uh, Zelim Khan, Yan Darbayev, and Aslan Maschadev, they sealed, uh, well, they sort of turned, to, turned the page of uh, this uh, secular uh, movement and they introduced uh, Sharia in Chechnya. And uh, obviously, um, uh, it, it was becoming obvious that uh, Chechnya was becoming a fundamentalist country. Uh, you had the introduction of uh, Sharia uh, courts. Well, exactly this time, uh, a man by the name uh, Ahmad Kadyrov, who is uh, cre uh, was cr uh, current president's father, um, Ramzan Kadyrov, uh, he he was, originally he was very anti-Russian, but he grew increasingly worried about this Wahhabi movement that was sweeping throughout Chechnya, and uh, he began cooperating with uh, Putin, Vladimir Putin. Uh, and this is when you hear the term Chechenization of the war, meaning now uh, you had two factions in Chechnya fighting. You had the Wahhabism led by these guys and the uh, Chechen, uh, traditional uh, Chechen Sufi leaders such as uh, Ahmad Kadyrov. Well, uh, eventually uh, Russians got an upper hand in the war. Uh, most of these uh, jihadi militant leaders were assassinated. It was just uh, astonishing how they were able to track everyone down and get rid of them. Uh, for instance, uh, they got rid of Uber, Umar ibn al-Khattab, so they were having a hard time finding him. So what they did, they actually learned that he was writing letter to his mother in Saudi Arabia. They found the messenger who was delivering the letters back and forth, uh, got the letter, put a nerve agent on it, sealed it, gave it to the messenger, the messenger went back, gave to Umar al-Khattab, he opened it thinking that the letter is from his mother, was immediately par paralyzed and was killed right on spot. Uh, the messenger later was killed by the order of Shamil Basayev in Baku, Azerbaijan uh, as a revenge. Uh, and um, um, uh, the KGB sort of uh, tried to get a credit for assassinating uh, Shamil Basayev, but uh, there are a lot of pundits saying that it was an accident which happened in some remote village in Dagestan. Something just uh, exploded and he was killed. Uh, well, uh, in 2004, uh, Ahmad Kadyrov II uh, gets assassinated, the guy who was leading this Chechenization movement. Uh, Shamil Basayev claimed responsibility during a military parade in Chechnya. Uh, there was an explosive placed under his seat. It went off. He was killed right on spot. His son, um, uh, Ramzan Kadyrov, uh, became president in 2004, and uh, he rules Chechnya with iron fist. He's a Chechen nationalist, embraces Islam, uh, and periodically he sort of organizes these Islamic conferences in Grozny, invites scholars from uh, the different uh, countries, including Saudi Arabia, and sort of tries to convey a message that, look, uh, we're a moderate Muslim country, we don't have any... Um, 
uh, an intention of becoming a fundamentalist country. And uh, a lot of people say that the reason that uh, Chechnya has been such a good example of pacification is because the elites are ro uh, loyal to Moscow, which is very true. Uh, I mean, uh, it's the fourth recipient of uh, Russian federal budget. You have uh, billions of rubles being poured to sort of keep uh, the Russian uh, Chechen elites happy. And uh, to be fair, some of the money, of course, is used to build hospitals and um, uh, and schools, etc., etc. Now I want to briefly talk about the uh, Russian model of uh, Muslim integration and the so-called uh, patriotic Islam in Russia. But before doing so, let me just briefly talk about the French and British Muslims and compare those two with the Russian. So traditionally, Britain has embraced the uh, liberal, multicultural uh, approach of uh, assimilating uh, uh, Britain's Muslims. And for decades, uh, it, they had the hands-off approach, meaning government was not intervening. Hands-off approach. Well, uh, and they reduced all these assimilation programs to a very local level. Well, things changed after 9-11 uh, and the growing uh, alienation of Britain's Muslims, uh, the radicalization of some of its population. So this is when uh, the British government realized that they need to be more uh, involved. And yes, uh, till today they encourage diversity, uh, but uh, there's, there's this whole new concept of adopting the British values, the shared British values. Yes, you have the right to be different, but also you have the duty to be uh, integrated. Uh, France has taken a tougher step compared to uh, Britain. The whole assimilation uh, has evolved around the notion of secularism. I mean, good for France, it's a secularist country, it can choose whatever it wants. Uh, however, it is also uh, fair to claim that this didn't really produce the uh, uh, desi uh, desired results. It has totally alienated uh, of France's Muslim population. You have suburbs, suburbs in Paris that have nothing to do with Paris. And this has caused a massive problem for French security forces, particularly having access to Muslim community and preventing any radical sentiments that may occur. In Russia, uh, this, uh, uh, this whole assimilation problem of Russia's Muslims is uh, heavily associated with an intense sense of national security. And unlike Britain and France, uh, Russia not only has to sort of uh, assimilate its migrant Muslims coming from Central Asia and other uh, Muslim countries, but also ethnic Muslims who have been in Russia for uh, many centuries. And in Russia, the approach is semi-authoritarian, uh, and this is the product of Catherine's liberalism versus uh, other Tsarist and Soviet's crackdown of, uh, on Islam. So you have the mixture of both. And uh, you have a vertical distribution of power when it comes to religion. Meaning, uh, the spiritual board is in charge of uh, the Muslim community, and the Russian central government is in charge of the spiritual board. So you have a vertical distribution of power, which is uh, heavily scrutinized. And again, both the FSB, the new name of the KGB, and the central government are heavily in control of this uh, organizations. Uh, obviously, uh, like Britain and France, you have cooperation with mosques and religious leaders. You have the training of imams, uh, both in France, br uh, Britain, and uh, uh, Russia as well. The government actually sponsors these uh, Islamic institutions in all three co countries to sort of prevent from, uh, from the foreign Islam being exported to their respective uh, countries. In Russia, you have patronage networks. Uh, for instance, some of the members of the spiritual board having personal relations with some of the bureaucrats. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, you have heavy uh, central government intervention in clerical bodies. Sometimes the government tries to manipulate the competition between clerics to get an upper hand. And uh, you have, uh, like I mentioned, Islamic bureaucracy have heavily controlled by the central uh, government. So uh, Vladimir Putin, throughout his uh, governments, he constantly emphasizes the importance of uh, integrating Islam into uh, uh, Russia's uh, socio-political realm. Uh, he constantly tries to depict Russia as a multicultural and multi-ethnic uh, uh, country. Probably has learned his lesson that what happens when Russian uh, elites antagonize Muslim populations too much. And on one occasion, he even said that... Um, his, his own orthodox religion is closer to Islam than to Catholicism, and everyone was slightly confused about it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so uh, he constantly t the, tries to ex sort of depict Islam as an integral, integral part of the Russian Federation. He has, in fact, encouraged the mosque building, and this picture is from uh, 2015. 
uh, he sort of gave a speech praising Islam, praising Russia's Muslims. And uh, this is the opening of Russia's uh, mosque uh, cathedral uh, in 2015, one of the most grandiose and largest uh, mosques in Europe. And uh, a lot of pundits and politicians have argued that uh, Putin's approach has paid off, uh, and they cite uh, two uh, events from recent history. The first being the annexation of Crimea, the uh, taking of the Crimea, where many uh, Muslim clerics uh, traveled from Russia to uh, Crimea and sort of tried to convince local Tatars that they would be better off under uh, Putin. Uh, you have, there are claims that uh, Putin has a Chechen division fighting in Syria, which something well, this would be hard to imagine many many years ago, uh, given the loyalty uh, versus Islam thing, and uh, I, I believe there is a division close to a thousand people uh, fighting in Syria. But uh, there are other pundits also who claim that this uh, deployment of Chechen troops is not because uh, Putin has enough faith on these Chechen fighters that they will be loyal enough. It's because when an ethnic Russian gets killed in Syria, there is uh, there is a massive usually an outcry in. Um, in Moscow, but when someone sort of gets killed from North Caucasus, no one really talks about this. So uh, some critics of Putin said that this is just another step to avoid any criticism uh, in Moscow. Uh, well, again, this shows the division between uh, ethnic Russians and its uh, uh, and, and people in North Caucasus. Uh, if you ask me today, uh, the most integrated uh, Muslims in Russia are Tatars. Uh, the situation, and uh, this has to do uh, after so many decades of such a harsh crackdown on religion, uh, the integration would not be a problem, you would think. Uh, in North Caucasus, the situation is different. Uh, you have some, uh, again, resur uh, uh, rising resurgency over there. Uh, but uh, and uh, the, there is such a huge distance between Moscow and North Caucasus that really Moscow can can cannot know exactly what's happening on the ground, and uh, everything is learned through uh, elites or through security forces, etc. And uh, again, like I mentioned, the situation in North Caucasus has uh, relatively been quiet, not because people are fully integrated. It's just because uh, uh, Putin has managed to get. Uh, uh, local elites to be to be loyal to him, and uh, will this situation last forever? It's it's really hard to say. Um, I will conclude my presentation over here, and uh, you guys are welcome to ask any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, well, uh, I, like I mentioned, it's everything is done through uh, the spiritual board of a uh, uh, Muslim spiritual board, and technically everything is done through this bureaucracy. Yeah, I, I cannot off top uh, off the top of my head, I cannot think of any names of any uh, clerics who are sort of are known for being in charge. But uh, like I said, it's just an Islamic bureaucracy controlled by the central government. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I would probably go with Uzbekistan because uh, at this time Tashkent, uh, Tashkent, which is the current pres. Uh, Sorry, the ca uh, current capital of uh, Uzbekistan. Well, this is this was the, the city was sort of the cultural center of uh, Muslim Muslims of Turkestan. So I would definitely say that um, uh, uh, the the longest war actually took place in Uzbekistan. Uh, even uh, at, at this time, you didn't have like concrete countries. Uzbekistan it was just a, a, a town, a region that took name, by the name Turkestan. So even after the collapse of the Soviet Union, I would probably argue you had the most uh, guerrilla fighting. Uh, taking place in uh, in Uzbekistan. For instance, you had the uh, Islam Lashkolari, which I believe is translated as Warriors of Islam, or the Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, which uh, the 
kept the whole region on constant alert. And uh, just to uh, continue, and this is going to be a slightly long answer to your question, sorry. So uh, again, uh, just to prove how uh, Uzbekistan tr uh, proved to be a, a harder uh, example, uh, in early 90s, these resurgent uh, the organizations were pretty successful. They, uh, they controlled several important cities in Uzbekistan, and they were really close to introducing Sharia. Uh, so, and the president back then, Islam Karimov, who passed away last year, I believe, he was very hesitant to intervene because he, he too was scared uh, and uh, he, he was concerned. I don't want to say scared, but he was really hesitant to intervene. But things, as things got out of control, he had to sort of crack down these Islamic uh, uh, organizations. And some of them uh, fled to Afghanistan where they joined the Taliban. And they even staged as a revenge stage an uh, assassination attempt on Islam Karimov, the president back then. And blew up buildings in Tashkent and everywhere. So uh, technically, uh, uh, I don't maybe it has to do, uh, I cannot think of a concrete reason why Uzbekistan is a, a special case, but I would definitely argue that uh, the struggle lasts the longest in Uzbekistan compared to other uh, Central Asian countries. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, you alluded to the young Turks in the earlier 20th century mm. export country, country. Mm. Um, it seems to be the same happened after the collapse of the Soviet Union when the Turkish government was very eager to expand its influence, cultural and otherwise, into Central Asia. Mm -hmm. um, this is paralleled by Petula Druza and his movement sort of also expanding here. Um, can you comment on that? It seems like the Turkish attempt really fell on their face, and I'm curious if this was largely due to the Russification or cultural assimilation during the Soviet Union, or what would be the reason? Yeah, uh, if you ask me, the reason would be the dire experience uh, that non-Muslim uh, minorities ha uh, had while being under the Ottoman rule. And this is something, uh, obviously, uh, the Greeks cannot tolerate this. Armenians definitely cannot tolerate this. And Russians realize, too, that the moment countries like Armenia, or uh, uh, if they fall, that that's going to be like another uh, major major. Uh, sort of objective for the Turks to expand all the way to Central Asia. So uh, again, I would definitely give a lot of credit to uh, uh, Christians uh, who have sort of uh, proved to be very resilient when it comes to like uh, sort of combating pan-Islamism or so, uh, stuff like that. So, and Russia too, Russia did uh, some credit to Russia. It did actually prevent the uh, Turkish expansion towards Central Asia, just realizing that it would just pose a significant existential threat to uh, to their own country as well. So it's a combination of everything. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, I've really been doing research in some institutions in New York City on ancient India. And I was wondering if your presentation today, thinking to locations such as Kalusha and Ragland, what do you think, uh, since the uh, basis of some of the kind of research in agriculture and healthcare, what the lives and Uh, well, uh, that's a that's a that's a very ex that's that's an excellent question. Uh, so, um, pro agricultural problems in Central Asia. Well, uh, the situation was slightly imp improved uh, during the Soviet period. Well, compared to uh, the beginning years of the Soviet Union, like the seventies, that was the time when the Central Asia too was sort of like experiencing some sort of agricultural revival. But as after the collapse of the Soviet Union, like other republics, everything just went down. So definitely, uh, I, I wouldn't say there has been any major achievement in terms of, uh, you know, uh, agriculture. But uh, I mean, looking at Kazakhstan, the amount of achievements that have, uh, uh, you know, managed in recent years, that sort of gives gives hope. But that again, it's because Kazakhstan has so much natural resources, which I cannot. Uh, ascribed to uh, other Central Asian countries. But in terms of agriculture, I think the situation is pretty dire. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, uh, and yes, ma'am. Right. 
Yeah, so again, this is uh, not because, I don't know, maybe he genuinely believes that Islam is part of Russia's uh, uh, Russia's so sociopolitical life or whatever, but he, he definitely has learned a lesson of what happens when you push too much, when you push the envelope too much. And one example that I can elaborate on, the Russian government did really support, for instance, in Chechnya, Chechen Sufis. And uh, you have the largest mosque uh, probably in all of Europe being built in Chechnya. Close to 10,000 worshippers can be there. You have, and the number is not 2.5 million, it's about, it's close to 4 million in Moscow now. And you have some of the grandiose mosques. I'm not saying that uh, he, he does this because he's such a great person, he cares about Muslims. He just understands that there is a question, there is a Muslim question and he needs to be strategic uh, uh, towards it. And if you t take a close look at it, there is a lot of similarity between his policies and Catherine, uh, Catherine the Great. Uh, and it, again, he tries to sort of uh, domesticate Islam, bring some sort of bureaucratization to it to help the Russian government to be better in charge of the uh, uh, of, of Muslim community. And I'm not saying he does this because he has such genuine intentions. He just does this to prevent any sort of, you know, Muslim upheaval. Uh, after all, the North Caucasus has witnessed some of the uh, uh, notorious uprisings in Russian history. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, ma'am. I just wonder how the war and how the people blame on the military because of the military. I just wonder, based on the culture, how do they teach different from the Japanese? In British or French, how do they have that kind of authority? Well, you had a lot. No, you have a, you had a lot of terrorism going on in Russia in early 2000s. Like I mentioned uh, just in my presentation, uh, Bestan. Bestan is Russia. You had uh, a Moscow theater siege uh, in the Nordost uh, in uh, in 2001. Close, uh, more than 100 people died. You have like the bombing of buildings by Chechen fundamentalists. Um, Russia did suffer from terrorism too. Um, Britain did suffer. France did suffer. Russia was no exception. And if, if you just, uh, and most of the, just, just recently, uh, in 2016, there was a massive uh, operation in Dagestan. And uh, I'm pretty much, you've seen this in news outlets where a police officer in Dagestan got uh, captured by an Islamic group just wandering in Dagestan freely. And uh, they put him on his knees and put the camera on his face and asked what he thinks about his authorities. And the guy looked at the camera and said, continue your good brothers. Well, he was shot on the face. And to say that Russia didn't suffer from terrorism, that was that, that, that just not true. <laughs> I cannot say how many people died in Russia or in Britain, but definitely Russia did suffer from terrorism too. Well, I wouldn't say it's a capitalist thing or communism thing. Uh, uh, it's just uh, the religious dissatisfaction. Some, some uh, for Shamil Basayev, the guy wanted to create a, a caliphate, a caliphate stretching from Black Sea to Volga. He was heavily influenced by Wahhabism, which in 2013 European Parliament recognized as a terrorist ideology, and these guys were heavily embracing it. Uh, and uh, I don't think that has to do with uh, capitalism, it's just uh, probably religious fundamentalism and uh, asymmetric response to Russian uh, powerful military. That, that's it. All right, thanks very much, folks. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate it.